started then. Uh, today uh, we're going to deal with uh, bound state perturbation theory. Uh, I, I think I hardly need to tell you how important perturbation theory is in physics. Uh, that's because uh, everywhere in physics there are problems that are close to solvable problems, and we need to make small perturbations around them. Uh, the Earth is really uh, a, a sphere, but not exactly. The Sun has most of the mass in the solar system. Uh, the period of molecular vibrations is uh, small compared to the, or rather as long as large period, compared to the period of electronic motions of the molecule. Uh, and then the hydrogen atom, the uh, effects of spin and relativity are small compared to the effects of the Coulomb potential. So these are just all examples of perturbation theory. Uh, so as I said today, we're going we're to be dealing with bound state perturbation theory, which has to do with the effects of perturbation on the uh, bound states of uh, discrete, let's say the discrete spectrum, the bound states of quantum systems. So let's assume we have a Hamiltonian for our system in the form of H0, plus the correction term will write as lambda H1. Let's assume that H0 is a Hamiltonian that we can solve, we know its energy levels and, and, uh, and uh, eigenvalues. In fact, let's uh, denote those in the following way. Let's call them K alpha like this. Let's call the energy levels epsilons of K. The notation here is, is that K is a label of the energy level, which we allow to be degenerate. Alpha is an index of these all degeneracies, so alpha runs one, two, and so on like this. So these are the uh, unperturbed energy levels that we know, we know by epsilons of K. Here, H1 is a perturbation. Uh, lambda is an interpolation parameter. Uh, then we use to switch on the perturbation so that the lambda is zero, we have just the unperturbed Hamiltonian, and the lambda is one, we have the full unperturbed system. It's oftentimes convenient to introduce this. In effect, lambda becomes a bookkeeping device, device for the order of the perturbations. <coughs> now, to give you a qualitative idea of what can happen, allow me to draw an energy axis here that corresponds to the unperturbed system H0. <coughs> And let me just schematically draw in what some of the energy levels might look like. This is actually not very realistic or a real problem. But let's call these energy levels epsilons of K, like this, running up and down. And let's focus our attention on just one of these energy levels, which is epsilons of N with the index N. And for the, for the duration of this discussion, we'll let the index N be fixed. We're going to be interested in perturbations of just that, just that one level. Now, the unperturbed system may also have a continuous spectrum. Frequently does in practice. If so, it's probably going to be at higher, it will be at a higher energy. Uh, and uh, that's important to keep in mind, especially later when we start writing on resolutions of the identity and so on. Those have to, have to include the continuum. But nevertheless, our, the attention of our perturbation theory is going to be focused on the bound states here, in particular this one, excellent again. Now, uh, in the, um, uh, when we turn on the perturbation to get H0 plus H1, uh, the energy levels, the unperturbed energy levels, will change around. And if they're degenerate, they will in general will split. So for example, our epsilon n level we're interested in might do this. It might split into three levels like this. Of course, if it did, it means that it was at least threefold degenerate. But it might be more than that, because the resulting levels that are, that are produced when the perturbation is turned on might themselves be degenerate. And this is a general case, a general sort of situation that happens in perturbation theory. Let's come out an exact one of the exact energy levels by capital E, one that grew out of the epsilon to the end. And uh, let's denote the exact energy eigenstate by psi. So the Schrodinger equation we wish to solve is at h psi, which is the same thing as h0 plus lambda h1 acting on psi, uh, should be equal to e psi like this. So psi here is the exact energy eigenstate, and E1 is the exact energy. As we vary the lambda parameter between 0 and 1, let's say we start at 1, speaking of the energy level E, it goes from the exact level E to back down to the unperturbed level epsilon n in a continuous manner. Likewise, the exact energy eigenstate psi out here at lambda equals 1, if we bring lambda back down to 0, it, it tracks back down and becomes some particular, uh, some particular uh, state which lies in the uh, unperturbed eigens eigenspace corresponding to eigenvalue epsilon in it. This is a degenerate eigenspace and it's some vector that lies in that space. And which one it is depends on which of these branches we call it back. All right, so this is the basic setup of the problem. 
Now, in the following, it will help to have some, uh, some of the geometry of Hilbert space in mind. Uh, to begin with, let me define epsilon or script EN, EN, uh, to be the unperturbed energy eigenspace. Uh, so EN is the uh, span of the unperturbed uh, energy eigen, eigenspace in alpha, uh, where alpha runs in is fixed and alpha runs over whatever range it runs over, like that. We're allowing this to be multidimensional. Uh, by the way, when this EN is multidimensional, we refer to a degenerate perturbation theory. And when it's only one dimensional, so the unperturbed eigenvalue is non degenerate, then we refer to non degenerate perturbation theory. I'll get into that a little more in detail later on. But for right now, I'm being general and assuming that F, the EN could be, could be multi dimensional, so we have the generacy of the unperturbed system. All right. Now, uh, Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, but let me make a very schematic sketch in which I draw one axis as EN like this. And the other axis is E in purple, which stands for the orthogonal subspace. So the Hilbert space splits up into two directions like this. Uh, uh, in practice, E in is oftentimes as a small dimension, whereas E in purple in practice is oftentimes infinite dimensional. So this, this uh, horizontal axis is kind of the easy axis to deal with. Now, the exact energy eigenstate psi is presumably close to some unperturbed. It's presumably close to some uh, state that lies in the unperturbed energy eigenspace EN. So on this diagram here, we can imagine it schematically as a vector, which is almost lying in EN. That's just what we mean by perturbation theory. It doesn't move too far away from the unperturbed eigenspace. This picture, so this, is, this is the state side and it's in a schematic diagram. This picture encourages us to think about the projection operators that project onto the unperturbed eigenspace and in the opposite direction. Let's call P the one that projects down, and let's call Q the one that projects to the left, like this. So that uh, P here, uh, explicitly, P is the sum on alpha of the outer product of N alpha with N alpha. This is just the projector on the amplitude of energy eigenspace, EN, epsilon N. And Q is a complementary projector, so it's 1 minus P. And that can be represented as the sum on all K which are not equal to N, and the sum on alpha of the outer product k alpha k alpha, like this. And uh, so these are the two projectors. Uh, these projectors have the usual properties of projectors. They, first of all, they're idempotent, so the square of p is equal to p and the square of q is equal to q. There are also orthogonal projectors, so qp equals pq equals zero. If you apply the two of them in, in, the different ones in, in succession, they just kill each other. Uh, their sum is equal to one because of complementary projectors. These are the main these are the main properties of these projection operators. Now, if we take the projection operator p and apply it to our exact eigenstate psi, it'll project it down like this and give us a, a vector that looks like this that lies in the unperturbed eigenspace. Let's write this as p psi. And what's left over is the is the complementary vector that points like this. This is q psi. This is, obviously has to be small because this is a small deviation away from an unperturbed eigenstate. In the following, we're going to think of p psi as the easy part of this problem, and we'll think of q psi as the hard part. Uh, the reason for that is, is that p psi actually is an unperturbed eigenstate. And we know what the unperturbed eigenstates are because we're assuming that we, we can solve the unperturbed system. Usually, there's not very many of them. So this p psi, whatever it is, is, is a linear combination of usually some small number of states that we know. Whereas the Q size in the orthogonal direction, this is an infinite dimensional space and many times in practice it is. And so this, this is in some sense a hard part of the problem. So this is just a way of thinking about these two parts, P side and Q side. All right. Now, to proceed, allow me to take the eigenvalue eigenvector problem, which looks like this, and rearrange it by bringing the lambda H1 term over to the other side. And so I'll write it like this as P minus uh, E minus H naught applied to psi uh, is equal to lambda times H1 applied to psi. <coughs> uh, now, uh, in analyzing this equation, it turns out to be useful to consider the inverse of the operator E minus H0. In the sense, we want to divide through by this to solve for psi. That's very roughly the idea. Um, actually, I'm not doing a very good job of motivating interest in the inverse. Uh, I could do a better job of it, but it would take a lot of time, and I think maybe it's better just to go ahead with it. But let's just say that dividing by e minus, e, e minus h0 is a useful thing to do. 
So let's consider this operator e minus 1 over e minus h zero. This is an example of a function of an operator. E here is just a number. This is the exact energy eigenvalue to remind you. And h zero is the temperature. We don't know what e is yet, but at least it's just a number. And h zero is the temperature of Hamiltonian, which we do know all about. So this is, an, as I say, it's an example of a function of an operator. And you know the way you define a function of the operator is you write down the projectors and then you just replace the eigenvalues by the functions of the eigenvalues. So this is the sum of all k and, and, and alpha of the outer product k alpha k alpha. Those are the energy eigenstates, unperturbed energy eigenstates, divided by a denominator, which is e minus epsilon sub k. The e, here is, the e here in the two sides is just the number that I copied. And the epsilon of k is the value of h0 on the, on the state k alpha, which is the numerator. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's the inverse of this operator. Of course, not all operators have inverses. And there's a question whether this one does. Uh, actually, uh, more, moreover, there's, a, there's another worry, too, whether or not it really does have an inverse. There's another worry, which has to do with the terms k equals n. I'll just say, let's worry about those terms and put a question mark here. The reason to worry about the terms k equals n is because the denominator there is e minus epsilon n. But from this diagram over here, you can see that e is the exact energy level that grew out of epsilon n. So presumably, it's close to it because we're doing perturbation theory. So the difference between e and epsilon n is small. And thus, these denominators here, well, these denominators for those terms are going to be small. This is going to get large terms here. It's even worse than that if you let lambda go to zero, because then E approaches epsilon n, and then that denominator goes to zero, and this thing is not defined. So these are problematical terms in this, in this sum. And what we will do to handle that is just to exclude them. Let's consider a, a different sum, which is really the same thing, except we exclude the k equals n terms. The formula for it is the same. It's outer product k alpha k alpha divided by E minus epsilon k. However, this is no longer the inverse of e minus h0. It's a different operator now because we excluded some terms. But the point is that this is now well behaved. And none of these denominators are small. Let's give this operator a name, and I'm going to call it R here. And R here is a, it's really a mnemonic for resolvent. The resolvent operator is something that appears in uh, ethereal Green's functions. And this, this operator here is actually very, very close to what's called a resolvent. Now, um, now, uh, before I go on, there is a further worry here, which is that uh, we excluded the terms k equals n because those are the terms that are obviously small when you draw a diagram like this. What we need to ask, is it possible that any other terms for k not equals to n might also be small? In particular, suppose, the way I drew it, it's not true, but suppose there was another unperturbed energy level that was very close to Em. Let's call it epsilon n. Let's call it epsilon m is very close to it. This sort of thing happens very frequently in practice because many systems have uh, multiplets of closely lying uh, energy levels. And so when we turn on this perturbation that makes epsilon n grow into spread out, it's going to bump into epsilon sub n if it's close enough. If the perturbation is strong enough, in fact, if make the perturbation strong enough, it will, it will start devouring levels on, on either side and make it big enough. So there's a question about whether some other values of k should be excluded as well. But well, what I'm going to do for now is to assume that there are no energy levels close enough for such a thing to happen. And in other words, that all other unperturbed energy levels are far enough away and or the perturbation is weak enough so that the spreading is not too large so that we don't have to worry about colliding with neighboring levels. Uh, I'll come back at the end of this lecture, uh, this part of the lecture, and what happens if that's not true. But for now, let's just assume that's true. And that means that this operator is actually, actually well-behaved and in particular, there's not any large terms in it. All right. Now, what about the meaning of this operator R? What does it actually mean? Uh, we can get this, an idea of this if we take R, let's multiply on the left by E minus H0. Apply to R. E minus H0 is going to act on the ket K, K alpha, and it's going to bring out E minus epsilon K. That will cancel out the denominator. And so all you've got left is the sum of the projectors with the K equals N terms excluded. Well, that's the same thing as the Q projector you see right here. So this is actually equal to Q, it's the Q projector. And by the way, you may notice it would work the same in the other direction, that if I took uh, uh, R times E minus H0, E minus H0 acting from the right would act in those bras and bring up the same package with kill the denominators just as well. 
So R is an operator, which when multiplied by E minus H0 on either side gives us the operator Q. That's why it's not really the inverse of E minus H0, because then you get the identity here instead of Q. However, there's an interpretation of that, because the operator Q, which is the projector on the orthogonal subspace, can be regarded as the identity operator on that subspace. It doesn't do anything to vectors that are in that space, so it's an identity insofar as vectors in this space are concerned. And that's what R is. R can be understood this way. So it's the inverse of E minus H0 on the space, on the orthogonal subspace, E and E in per. As far as what R does to the uh, energy eigenspace EN is it annihilates it because uh, these K alphas are orthogonal to all the vectors that lie in the unperturbed eigenspace. So R is, R is zero in this space, but an inverse of E minus H zero in that space. All right, anyway, that's an interpretation of R. All right, now let me show you how this gets used in perturbation. You're taking the formula in the upper right corner of the board, which is basically just the energy eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector problem. And allow me, since it's way up there, you can use my pointer here. Allow me to multiply by r, let's say on the left-hand side, so we have r times e minus h0. We use this expression here, converts that into q. And then we get a factor of r on the right-hand side. So to copy this down, what we have is q times psi is then equal to lambda times r times h1 psi. And this is already a nice result because it's giving us the hard part of the perturbation. It's this part that sticks up like that. It shows you that it's small. It's a border lambda in terms of our resolving operator in H1 on psi. Now, we don't actually know what psi is, of course. Yeah, we haven't solved the problem. But we do know that psi is, is predominant contribution to psi is P psi. Q psi is a small correction. And P psi, we're thinking of as being easy. So we plug that in here, we get the hard part in terms of the easy part, and at least that's progress. Now, actually, I'm not going to do that because I don't need to make approximations yet. Uh, we'll proceed in the following way. Let's, uh, let's take P psi and add it to both sides of this equation. On the left-hand side, the P plus Q uh, projectors is 1, so we just get psi. And on the right-hand side, we get P psi plus this term, lambda R, H1 psi, like so. Okay? And so here's the P psi part that we think is easy, and here's the hard correction of Q psi written in that form. This, uh, this equation can be solved explicitly for psi, in the total psi, in terms of P psi in the following way. We bring this, we bring this order lambda term over to the left hand side and write it this way it's 1 minus lambda R H1. Uh, applied to psi is equal to p psi. Okay? And then in the moment I'm going to divide by this operator, it will generate a series. And that's supposed to be the basic series for perturbation theory. Before I do that, however, let me say some things about p psi. p psi is, a, again, is the projection of the exact eigenstate onto the undisturbed eigenstate. <coughs> Since p psi uh, lies in the unperturbed eigenspace, in the N, it must be a linear combination of the unperturbed eigenvectors that span that space. These are the vectors in alpha you see up here. So it must be possible to write P psi in this manner as a sum on an index beta times the unperturbed eigenvectors in beta with some expansion coefficients I'll call C beta. Allow me to plug that in like that. Um, these expansion coefficients have also have a, a, an interpretation. If I take the scalar product of, of both sides of this equation with n alpha, one of the unperturbed uh, eigenstates inside the, uh, inside the, inside the unperturbed uh, uh, eigen, eigenspace, for our level en, then on the left-hand side, we get n alpha p psi, obviously. But the projection P acting on N alpha moving to the left doesn't do anything to it because N alpha is already inside that, that uh, unperturbed eigenspace. So this is just the same thing as N alpha scalar product of psi. But applying the N alpha to the right hand side, it picks up just one term of this, of this sum, and so we get C alpha. So you can see the coefficients C alpha are actually the expansion coefficients of the exact eigenstate in terms of the unperturbed eigenvectors that lie inside the N. Well, in any case, let me go back here to this p psi and I'll write this as a sum on beta, uh, n beta times coefficient c, c beta, like this. 
we're going to need to know these coefficients C beta if we want to know what the P side, the projection of the exact eigenstate onto the unperturbed eigenspace, eigenspace is. All right. Now, uh, the next step is to divide through by this operator 1 minus lambda RH1. There's an uh, identity in the ordinary uh, calculus, which I, I, I'm sure you all know. It's this. It's 1, 1 of 1 minus x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. It's a Taylor series expansion of 1 over 1 minus x. And in dividing through by this to create the inverse operator, you can use the same, the same expansion series. It's a, now it's a, it becomes a series for operators, but it works in the same way. So dividing through by this, what we obtain is an expression that says this. So the psi is equal to the inverse of this operator times the <coughs> sum. Let me write it this way. I'll write this as sum on beta. Then I'll put the inverse of this operator, which is 1 plus lambda r h1 plus lambda squared r h1 r h1 plus so on. You write out the arbitrary term easily. Times n beta times multiplying c beta. Okay? So this is now an expansion in powers of lambda giving us the exact eigenstate in terms of a bunch of operators here acting on uh, acting on uh, the unperturbed eigenstates. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, the average of eigenstates in the in the uh, unperturbed basis. Now, uh, in the uh, excuse me, in the uh, unperturbed energy uh, energy eigenspace uh, E in E in. Uh, okay. Now, uh, the uh, this is a ba this is really the basic expansion on which we construct the perturbation. Uh, when I do this division, or when I rather when I do this expansion here, the expansion doesn't necessarily converge. I'm not claiming that this is an exact series anymore. It's now a formal series because it's, it's, uh, the expansion has been carried out. And in fact, the series may not converge. Frequently, it does not, as a matter of fact. Perturbation theory frequently gives rise to asymptotic series. Even though they don't converge, however, they're oftentimes useful for getting uh, corrections and approximations. So we don't really need convergence here to proceed, to proceed with, this, with this theory. Well, the next thing to do is to, get, uh, is to get expressions that will allow us to find the energy levels. And uh, we will do this this way. I'm going to combine this, this equation with what's on the upper board up there. Let me write it down, down here just to copy it down. E minus h0 acting on psi is equal to lambda h1 acting on psi. That's the exact energy uh, eigen. Eigen, uh, uh, eigen uh, uh, state and eigenvalue <coughs> problem. Let's take both sides of this equation here and let's multiply by, this will give myself room for this, let's multiply first of all by e minus h0 on both sides, coming in like this. This is, this is e minus h0 side, as you see here. And then let me, I hope you can see this here, probably it's not showing up too well in the movie. Let's then take the square root product of n alpha minus h0. So let's apply this multiplicative factor if you can see that to both sides of this equation. So on the left hand side what we get is n alpha times e minus h0 acting on psi. Now the e minus h0 acts to the left on n alpha because n alpha is an exact eigenstate of the unperturbed problem. The h0 gets replaced by epsilon n. That gives just a c number which comes out. This becomes e minus epsilon n. What's left over is the scalar product n alpha <coughs> psi. But as we saw up above, that's the same thing as the expansion coefficient c alpha. So we get e minus epsilon n times c alpha. That's doing this thing on the left-hand side here. Now, uh, as far as the right-hand side is concerned, let's take uh, the right-hand side is going to be is going to be bra n alpha times uh, 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 let's see, yes, yes, so, so, yes, so here's what we've computed so far is, is, is n alpha e minus h zero Side. That's the left hand side that worked out over there. And the right hand side has to be lambda in alpha scalar product of h1 side. Like so. So let's take lambda in alpha h1 psi and let's take for the side, let's take this series and plug it in right there. 
you see the series of sum and data, there's a bunch of operators. Here's a, again, uh, here's a, here's a vector. So the H1 is going to multiply this series. We've got this H1 there, we this H1R, H1 there, H1R, H1R, H1 there, and the third term, and so on down the line. And so doing that, then what we get is, is that this whole thing now becomes equal to, I'll write this down again, it's B minus epsilon n times C alpha is equal to this, is equal to the sum on beta. And then we've got n alpha. And then there's an operator, which is this. It's lambda h1 plus lambda squared h1 r h1 plus and so on, lambda cubed h1 r h1 r h1. And then we have n beta. And then we've got coefficient c beta. Like this. And I'm going to box this equation because this is the basic equation we use for finding the energy levels, the return of energy levels. Okay. Now, to proceed with this, I'm going to take, uh, uh, first of all, a special case of, of non-degenerate perturbation theory. Of course, the non-degenerate perturbation theory, this, this epsilon n level is non-degenerate, so you don't get a splitting like this, although you could get that one level moving up and turning into some other energy. That's the sort of thing that would happen. This is stuck over here. Now, um, so up here we need to make change in, let me go back to this. Let's make change in notation for the non degenerate case. By the way, when we talk about the non-degenerate case, when I talk about the non-degenerate case, all I mean is, is that the energy level whose perturbations we are considering are non-degenerate. The other levels may still be degenerate. It's just this one. So in the non-degenerate case, in the first place, the, the, uh, the eigenstates in alpha, we don't need an alpha index anymore, so they just turn into a single uh, unperturbed eigenstate in. Also, we don't need the alpha and beta indices, so the coefficient C alpha and C beta and so on just turn into C. There's just one index now. The sum goes away. Uh, and if we do this, let me just write this out. So for the non-degenerate case, the, the, energy, the energy equation, which is that boxed equation up there, becomes E minus epsilon n times C, because there's only one C. The sum of beta goes away. Uh, the n alpha just becomes n. Then we have lambda h1 plus lambda, lambda squared h1 r h1 plus dot 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 is the operator. And then we've got n on the right. And then we've got C beta over there just turns into C again, like this. <coughs> And so the expansion coefficients C, I can direct them the same on both sides, and I'll erase them, and we obtain this equation. And now we bring the epsilon in over to the other side, we can write this like this, and we see that E is equal to epsilon n, the exact energy level is equal to the unperturbed one, plus lambda, the first term is the, is the expectation value of the, un, of the perturbing Hamiltonian with respect to the unperturbed eigenstate. And the second order is lambda squared, and I need the operator h1 r h1. What is h1 r h1? It's equal to the sum on alpha, excuse me, k not equal to n, sum on alpha, outer product k alpha. Well, it's h1. h1, k alpha, outer product k alpha, h1 divided by the energy denominator, e minus epsilon n. E minus epsilon k. Using the definition of r, which I think by now disappeared. But um, this is what it gets. This is what it gets if you do this. Now we sandwich that between the n and the n on the two sides. So the answer can now be written this way as the sum on k naught equals to n, sum on alpha, Putting an n on the left side here and an n on the right side there, you get two matrix elements in the numerator which are complex conjugates of each other. And so it turns into this. It's n h1 k alpha 
absolute value squared divided by E minus epsilon sub k. And this goes on in higher order terms. So writing out the energy, the non-degenerate energy equation explicitly through second order, this is what we obtain. Now, this is not exactly a solution for the uh, for the exact energy of the system, which is this, which is this capital E, because the capital E appears not only in the left hand side of the equation, but it also appears in the denominator of the second order term. However, in the second order term, this is already second order. So if I replace E by its zero order correction, which is the unperturbed eigenvalue, that doesn't change. The, this is still the second order term. So through second order, I can replace this this uh, E by epsilon N. And then what I obtain is energy denominators, which are the energy differences between uh, unperturbed uh, in energy energy levels in the second order term, the numerator, which is, which is strictly positive. So this is the uh, probably the most important result in the case of non-degenerate perturbation theory. It's a result that gets used a lot. Uh, the simplest thing to say is that the first order energy corrections, uh, this is worthwhile with remembering, you probably know it already, is that uh, the first order energy shift for a non-degenerate level is just the expectation value of the perturbing Hamiltonian with respect to the unperturbed energy eigenstate. And second order, there's a more complicated formula, but it's, uh, it involves a sum over all states which are not equal to the unperturbed eigenstate. Uh, uh, so these are, this is a complementary set of states. This is an infinite sum in general. And by the way, if there's a continuum, the sum really here is a schematic that represents a regular sum over the discrete levels, but also an integral over the continuum. But in any case, there is a numerator here which is uh, which is uh, a strictly positive. It's a square of the matrix element. And a denominator, let me write this just this way, epsilon n. There's a denominator, which is an energy denominator like this. Um, notice, by the way, if you're dealing with a special case of the perturbation of the ground state of the system, suppose it's non-degenerate, so this is the formula you use. Well, let's suppose the first order perturbations vanish, so you need to go on the second order. What you can see is, is, that the, uh, is that the second order perturbation, in this case epsilon n is the ground state, that's the minimum energy. So the epsilon k's which occur here, since k is not equal to n, are always greater than epsilon n. And the result is, is that the ground state energy can only get lowered by the perturbation. This is a special case, but it occurs frequently in practice. All right. Yes? Seems like it would be. Um, I guess I'm not sure why we're using it. It seems like you could use the, like, the previous word of perturbation for that or something. Like e, you should use like e plus. Well, this was this was this was the this was the exact energy e in the formula we derived right. a few steps ago okay. before I started erasing it. And uh, I. Re uh, so the result is, is that this is this is not an explicit solution for E because E occurs down here also. But this is only a second order term. And so if I just substitute in the zero order approximation for capital E, which is just epsilon n, that this will still be second order. It will induce further change to the third order, and the third order terms will become more complicated. I'd have to expand this out. But the second order is actually quite easy to do this and just replace it by epsilon n. And then we have an explicit solution through second order. All right? Yes. Uh, earlier you mentioned that the uh, the series representing the wave function uh, could be diverging. Yes. Uh, is that, but is the series representing the energy uh, always converging? No? no. No, in general it doesn't converge either. So then how do we claim that, that we have a correction uh, I mean if it's not converging? Well, uh, this, uh, the asymptotic series uh, oftentimes uh, give you a uh, uh, as you, as you add more and more terms, they frequently give you better and better approximations to the answer you're interested up, up to a certain point, and then they start to go bad and they start to diverge again. And it's actually fairly common in perturbation expansions if they behave that way, that they really are asymptotic series. Actually, in, in a little while, I'll tell you about the Stark effect, which is kind of interesting because that's an example when you turn in a perturbation, the bound state energy levels act strictly speaking disappear completely and get replaced by a continuum. But you don't see any evidence of that in the perturbation. So, if you, but on the other hand, if you carried out the series to high enough order, that would start to make its, its, its uh, presence known, and you'd see the perturbation where it's not converging. So the terms decrease, uh, but they don't decrease fast enough. No. They decrease up to a point, and then they start growing again. Okay. 
asymptotic series, uh, asymptotic series typically have the behavior of something like epsilon to the n times n factorial. So if epsilon is you know 10 to the minus 6 or something, you need to go out to about a million turns before the factorial starts. Starts. Uh, yes. Could you explain again why um, why you were saying like it lowers the ground state energy? Like in what in what sense? It's a special case. It's when the first order when the first order term vanishes. Suppose the first order perturbation and the ground state is zero, which happens sometimes. Is that is that what happens in anti-ferromagnetism? Sorry, that's like that. I don't know. I don't know, but it happens in the Clark effect in hydrogen, which we'll see, which we'll talk about in a little while. But this is a negative number. If n is the ground state, and this is a negative number because e n is equal to e zero, you see, n equals zero. This is a, it's always less than, than the case because the case is summed over all the other states. In this case, we have all the inside states. All right. Okay. So this is the basic energy equation for non-degenerate perturbation theory. Now, what about the uh, what about the wave functions? I think the wave functions will go back to uh, our wave function formula, which is right here. Now, and we'll make the same changes for the non-degenerate case, and the sum goes away, and the C beta here just turns into a single C, and this beta index disappears. And so what we have is, is we have psi, and I'll put the C out front like this. It's been a, an operator, one uh, plus lambda r, H1 plus dot 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 applied to the unperturbed state in. This is what we get. Now, to write this out more explicitly, this is C times the unperturbed state in plus lambda, inserting the expression for R, it's the sum on K not equals to N and the sum on alpha. And then what we've got is K alpha, and then we have K alpha matrix sum of H1 with N divided by energy denominator, which is E minus epsilon C K plus dot dot dot. This is writing this out explicitly. Now once again, the, the energy eigenvalue appears here, but the lowest order, that's the same thing as epsilon C N, so I can put that in. And I get the same approximate energy denominators if we're using the second order corrections to the energy levels. These denominators now appear in the first order corrections to the wave functions. So notice that the exact wave function here is given explicitly as the unperturbed eigenfunction function in at the end, and then the corrections are all in the orthogonal direction because the sum excludes the case k equals n. So you can think of a vector with a small, it's really the same as this guy, oops, I erased it. This is, this is the, this is the p psi, and that's the q psi term. That's what it is. All right. Now as far as the constant c is concerned, we can uh, do this by squaring both sides. If we assume that psi is normalized, then when you square it, you're going to get 1 on the left-hand side. You're going to get c squared on the right-hand side. I'll assume c is real because it's a phase convention for the state side. And now squaring the thing in the parentheses, the n scatter product of itself is 1. And if you look at the cross terms of the first two terms, those are 0 because n times k alpha is 0. There are orthogonal states. So there is no order lambda correction. And the next correction that's out of order lambda squared, like this. So through order lambda, which is all we've got here, c is, we can write this by taking the square root, we can say c is equal to 1 plus order lambda squared. And so if you're only interested in going through order lambda, I can take this equation and just set c as 1, erase the parentheses here. And then what we obtain is the expression uh, for the perturbation in the, in the uh, energy eigenfunction in non-degenerate case, and I'll put in an epsilon in here instead of an e. And uh, this is the, uh, this also is a quite useful result in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, non-degenerate perturbation theory, giving, giving us the correction for the eigenstates. Okay. Now, let's do the degenerate case. Uh, this equation is quite general and covers the degenerate case as well as the non-degenerate one. Let me clear okay, some space here and not erase the things that I really can read. In the degenerate case, well, uh, to recapitulate slightly, in the non-degenerate case, we got the corrections to the energy levels through second order, but only the wave functions through first order. Yes? 
Um, how come if it's sort of lambda squared and take the square root, it's still, that's right, and then the coefficient proceed? Because if I have, you know, one plus lambs, one plus three lambda squared, and I take the square root of that, that's equal to one plus three halves lambda squared, it's still the square root of that. Um, okay, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, yes, as I was saying, uh, in non-degenerate theory, we carry the corrections to the energy levels for second order, but the corrections to the wave function only the first order. In the degenerate case, I'm just going to carry the corrections to the energy levels to the first order, and as far as the wave functions go, we'll only get them to zero order. One can go to higher orders, but in practice, this is what you mostly need most of the time. So as far as the energy levels are concerned, let's take this equation and just carry it through order lambda h1 and neglect all the rest of the terms here. If we do this, then what we get is d minus epsilon n times c alpha is equal to the sum on beta of the matrix element n alpha and n beta sandwiched around lambda h1. So I'm going to put lambda up front. Sum on beta of n alpha h1 n beta times the coefficient at the end, which is c beta. And this is a basic rule for, um, for the lowest order uh, corrections to the energy in degenerate perturbation theory. What you can see is, is that the e minus epsilon n's, let me go back to my diagram here, this one, because in the degenerate case, it will, in general, it will split at the different levels. So that diagram is supposed to indicate that an original level epsilon n can split into several different energies, capital and E. But what are those energies? Well, the E minus epsilon n is the amount of splitting. It's the difference between the exact and the integer level. You can think of the C's as, a, as an eigenvector, and it's an eigenvector of an equation of a, of a matrix, which are the matrix elements of the perturbing Hamiltonian inside the degenerate eigenspace of the unperturbed system. Well, this is just the end here, it's the fixed, the fixed uh, energy level. So here's the rule. If you form the matrix of the perturbation inside the, inside the eigenspace <coughs> of the unperturbed system, and you find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the eigenvalues are the energy shifts, and the eigenvectors, the C's, are the coefficients which are used. Did I erase this already? The coefficients that are used to expand C size to sum of beta of n beta times C beta. The C's are the coefficients of the unperturbed energy eigenspace inside that uh, degenerate eigen, eigenspace whose linear combinations give you the projection of the exact state onto that space. The uh, Q psi correction is smaller. It's a first order. So the zero order, this is all you need. This shows you which vector in the unperturbed eigenspace the given energy level goes to, the given eigenstate, exact eigenstate goes to if you take lambda back down to zero. So, uh, so there's a linear algebra problem in diagonalizing a matrix in degenerate perturbation theory. This takes care of the energy levels. And this takes care of the, of the wave functions through zero order, through zero order. Because to zero order, uh, this, is, this, is equal, this is equal to the exact state psi plus order lambda, which is a first order correction. Or to land would be the Q side term, which you don't care about if you were to lowest order. Okay, so that's the summary of the rules for degenerate perturbation theory. Now, there's only one more thing that I want to issue that I want to address, and that's the question of uh, what, what I, I like to call nearly degenerate perturbation theory. I don't know if anybody else uses that terminology. But the, here is the issue to go back to this diagram. Let's suppose that there's another level called an epsilon m which is close enough to the level epsilon n that when you turn in the perturbation, the, the, spreading, the spreading out through the perturbation is going to cause a collision with an epsilon m here. Now what that means is, is that we can't use this R sum that we got that we used before, that I wrote about before, because there's now going to be small denominators involving epsilon m. And the question is, what do we do? Well, the answer is actually fairly simple. There's actually more than one answer, but I'll give you one way of doing this. We'll take the problem and we'll re rewrite it and we'll become the problem in an ordinary degenerate perturbation theory. Let's take the h equals h0 plus h1 of our original problem. 
Now let's write h0 in terms of its trajectory. So it's the sum of all k and alpha of epsilon k times the outer product k alpha k alpha. And so, uh, and then we've got these two levels, epsilon n and epsilon m, that we're worried about. Let's choose, let's choose some, uh, let's choose some uh, level, call it epsilon bar, which is somewhere in here. It might be the average of the two, or it might be one of the two, epsilon n or epsilon m. It won't matter as long as it's close to these two here. Call it epsilon bar. And let's define h, h, uh, an h0 prime in the following way. So first of all, we sum on all k, which are not equal to n and m, and alpha, on the same sum that's above, epsilon k. K alpha, K alpha. And then for the N and M terms, sum where K is equal to N and M and alpha, we replace the epsilon K by the epsilon bar, which is a pretty good approximation because it's right in there. And this is outer product K alpha, K alpha, like this. So that's H0 prime. And as far as H1 prime is concerned, it's equal to H1 plus terms that make the answer turn out to be the same as the unprime sum. Okay, so it's H1 plus a sum on K is equal to N comma M and alpha of now epsilon of K minus epsilon bar times K alpha K alpha. The effect of doing this is to merge these two nearly degenerate per, uh, unperturbed levels, epsilon n and epsilon n, m, into the same level, epsilon bar. It doesn't change the energy eigenstates, they're still the same, but the eigenvalue is now epsilon bar. That means that h zero prime is now really degenerate, the degenerate level. And then to throw the correction terms into H1, which is okay because they're, they're in the same order as the as the original perturbation of H1. At least they will be if H1 is of a degree of size such as to mix these two levels together. So once you've done this, then you can, this reduces to a problem in degenerate perturbation theory. As I say, things like this are quite common in practice because of the existence of multiplets, close line multiplets that you are interested in doing the relations on. Okay. Well, that's all for perturbation theory. And um, I don't want to make it easy to begin. That's the basis of perturbation theory. So it includes the most important cases in practice. And uh, the, I'm not only to make a beginning on the first application of this, which is to the Stark effect in hydrogen and alkali atoms. Stark effect concerns the effect of electric fields on atomic energy levels. Uh, the uh, Stark is the uh, physicist who first carried out the experiments. He won his Nobel Prize for doing it. Uh, he was a um, uh, he was obviously a brilliant man. He uh, anticipated by about ten years the work of Compton on the uh, Compton, Compton scattering. It was he was one of the, the first people to take seriously Einstein's ideas about uh, the existence of particles of light. People didn't call them photons yet at that time, but that's of course what they were. Uh, everybody thought Einstein was crazy, which Stark didn't. And in fact, he proposed experiments that were quite about ten years earlier. Uh, than Compton that, in, that were very similar to what Compton actually did carry out later on. And when Compton finally did carry out his experiments in 1923, that was what really convinced people that photons were real. Uh, nevertheless, he didn't get along very well with Einstein. They had, they had serious conflicts. And in fact, later on, Stark became a Nazi. So he's, he was a complicated character, let's say. But in any case, um, the uh, Stark effect, uh, we'll talk about the Stark effect in the case of hydrogen and alkali, alkali atoms. Uh, to make this simple, I'm going to use a, uh, an electrostatic model for these atoms. So the unperturbed Hamiltonian will just simply be a, a kinetic plus potential energy, uh, central force potential for, uh, for the atom. In the case of hydrogen, of course, the unperturbed potential V0 of R is equal to minus E squared over R. In the case of an alkali, the unperturbed potential V0 of R is equal to, well, there's no formula for it. Uh, you can't, uh, there's no simple formula for the potential in the case of an alkali, but uh, physically you picture this as being due to a screened uh, Coulomb potential. And as far as a, a picture goes, uh, both of these potentials are qualitatively the same. If I draw the potential energy for hydrogen, of course, that passes goes to zero as R goes to infinity, and it goes to minus infinity as R goes to zero. 
the alkali potentials qualitatively do the same thing. They uh, have a stronger, uh, there's a stronger electric uh, force near the nucleus, so they go to zero faster. Out of larger radii, they go to zero about the same speed as hydrogen. Uh, instead of plotting this as a function of the radius r, let me plot it as a function of, of the coordinate z along the z axis. So we can talk about the potential also in the negative z axis. And if we do, it's a symmetric, symmetric curve that looks like this. And then there are bound states in this and this well here, which are the bound states of the atom. All right. Now, a basic question that we can ask before we start to proceed to do perturbation theory is how accurate are the results going to be? This is an electrostatic model, which I'm choosing for simplicity, but that means it's neglecting uh, all kinds of small effects, such as the fine structure effects of spin. Spin is not going to appear here. We're treating electrons if it's spinless. But of course, in, in the atoms, the spin is really there and it has an effect. And so the question is going to be is how accurate, how realistic are our, our answers going to be in the perturbation theory? The answer to this is that if the, if the electric field that they applied to the atom is strong enough, our answers are going to be good. Uh, but if the electric field is weak, it won't be good. And the reason is, is that there are, there are splittings in these, in these nominal levels that come from the electrostatic model that are due to a uh, fine structure and spin, small splittings. If the electric field is weak, then the effect of the electric perturbation is smaller than the splitting. <coughs> therefore, qualitatively, the answers are not going to be right uh, if, we ignore, if we ignore fine structure. On the other hand, if the electric field becomes strong enough, then it can, in effect, overwhelm the small splittings that are already there present in the unperturbed system. And so for strong electric fields, the answers we get by this model are actually realistic. And so I think since I'm out of time, I'll have to uh, continue that next time. That's all. Thank you.